Welcome everyone. I'm Afraim Katsir. Sephardic Heritage International in DC or Shin DC is delighted to host Rachel Valeli Glazer's three-part series, The Jews of Greece, From Antiquity to the Present, with the Embassy of Greece to the USA and the Embassy of Israel to the US. We would like to acknowledge some of our members, Shin partners Rose and Robert Capon, who dedicate this program in loving memory of Daniel Capon and Sophie Sassbon Capon, Alehem Shalom. We also recognize the Valeli and Glazer families who dedicate this program in loving memory of Emmanuel and Emily Valeli, Alehem Shalom. The opening remarks for this first session will be given by Tammy Ben Haim, Minister for Public Diplomacy at the Embassy of Israel in Washington, D.C., where Minister Ben Haim has served in that role since August 2018. As a career diplomat, Tammy has spent more than 15 years in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and over 20 years in civil service. During her time at the ministry in Jerusalem, Tammy worked on both the Central and South Asia desks. In prior years, she served as Deputy Chief of Mission in Athens, Greece, and as Counselor for Internal Politics in New Delhi, India. Before joining the Foreign Ministry, Tammy worked in media relations at the Ministry of Environmental Protection, the Ministry of Finance, and in the Finance Committee of the Knesset, Israel's Parliament. She also worked as an advisor to several lawmakers in the Knesset. In the Israeli Armed Forces, Tammy's role was Operations Officer for the Air Force and concluded her service with a rank of Lieutenant. Tammy has a Master's Degree in International Relations from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. It's with great honor and pleasure that I present a wonderful friend and colleague, Minister Tammy Ben Haim, to share the opening remarks. Thank you uh, so much, Ephraim. And going back to my military service, it's almost like going to the Jews in antiquity in Greece. <laughs> There's a, it's only a slight uh, year, you know, a couple years difference. Uh, but thank you so much. And, you know, of course, I officially will say thank you to you soon. But it's always uh, a pleasure working with UFI and working with Shin DC. And, you know, we love your programs. And exactly like you mentioned, I'm uh, for the past two and some years, I've been the Minister for Public Diplomacy here in Washington, which is amazing. But my five years as the Deputy Ambassador in Athens uh, have really left a mark on me. And... You know, I got to know uh, the Greek people and Greece and the Jewish uh, community in Greece. Uh, so this is another reason, of course, professionally, but personally, I'm very, very happy uh, to be uh, part of this webinar. And I said a big thank you to you, Ephraim. And I'm really uh, looking forward to hearing the words of Rachel uh, Valeli Glazer um, about, uh, about the Jews, because there's always, always new things to learn. And of course, uh, a big thank you to our very, very good friends at uh, the Embassy of Greece here in DC, who are always uh, willing to cooperate and work uh, together on the evening tonight and on the series that you all have planned. Um, and I'll just say a couple of words because, you know, I don't think people are aware of, of how big or how long the history of the Greeks, of the Jews and Greeks are, you know, going back some say to 200 uh, uh, BCE and for generations we've seen Jews in different places of Greece, the Saloniki that was the Jerusalem of the Balkans and we still see them uh, you know in Patlas in Athens in uh, the Saloniki today and when I served there I saw you know a lively community uh, that together with the rest of the Greek uh, country in the Greece the country of Greece and Greek uh, citizens were proving their resilience uh, by dealing with a huge economic uh, crisis and we saw some issues that rose, uh, but the Greek government and the Greek people worked side by side with the Jewish community, uh, both to honor and preserve uh, the history and the presence of the Jews uh, to this day in their country. And because we're doing this in October, I'll be remiss not to mention uh, the landmark court decision right. earlier this month by the Greek, co uh, the Greek court that found the Chisi of Gi the Golden Dawn uh, neo-Nazi party uh, as a criminal organization and the brave decision of the court to take the leaders of the party and say that they have to serve 
jail time. And I think uh, this court ruling will set a precedence for dealing with these sorts of neo-Nazi anti-Semitic uh, organizations. So strong statements such as we saw from the courts together with other important steps taken in the past few years, uh, beginning to build a Holocaust museum in Thessaloniki, uh, voting for the first Jewish mayor ever in uh, the city of Yanina, and of course the growing and ever expanding relationship between Greece and Israel these days uh, are clear and true indication uh, that Greece is proud of its Jewish heritage and part, uh, you know, and wants to continue growing it. And we are always, uh, the embassy here and Israel, we are always, always happy to cooperate with our good neighbors and friends. Uh, so thank you again, and I'm looking forward to this evening. All right, thank you so much, Tammy. We now turn to Rachel Vallali Glazer who is an esteemed member of SHIN. Rachel is an educator who was born in Patras, Greece, and immigrated to the US with her parents and three older siblings in 1956 at the age of eight. Although missing their life in Greece, the Vallali family was grateful for, for the opportunity to have a new start in America, following all the sadness and personal losses they suffered during the Holocaust. In America, Rachel became active in Jewish life and has dedicated her career to formal and informal Jewish education. The Baltimore Center for Jewish Education recognized Rachel's lifelong dedication to Jewish life and education with its Lifetime Achievement Award. We now turn to Rachel Vallely Glazer for The Jews of Greece from Antiquity to the Present, part one of three. Thank you, Ephraim, and thank you, Tammy, uh, for all of your uh, words. And uh, it is certainly a pleasure for me to be here. Kalispera, good evening to everyone. Efharistos eolus puirthete. And uh, we will begin now. Uh, also, a special thank you to the embassies of Greece and Israel for co sponsoring this event. Both cultures are a central part of this story, and of course, to me personally. So I also want to thank the members of my family who have joined us this evening. This weekend, we entered the new Hebrew month of Cheshvan, known for having no special days in it. For our family, however, the yard sites of both my parents, Emily and Emmanuel, do make this month one of special memories. Usually, when I give this talk, I ask the audience about their Jewish ethnicities. And for the most part, the response is overwhelmingly Ashkenazi. Of course, tonight, it is probably safe to assume that many of you have some Sephardic heritage, yes? What about Greek? Sephardic Greek? Or the lesser known Romaniot Greek? And are there any Ashkenazi among us? And not to forget mixed heritages, of course. I am a Greek Jew, a Jew of Greek ethnicity. My family immigrated to America in 1956, settling in Baltimore. I was eight years old at the time. Truth be told, most Jews today have little knowledge of Greek Jewry and their history. As recently as 30 years ago, Greek Jews were all identified as Sephardic. No one questioned the ex accepted division of the Jewish people into two groups, Ashkenazi and Sephardic. But for some of us, this just did not ring true. We did not have Spanish names, did not speak Ladino or Spanish, and we were not connected to Spanish culture. It was not until I myself began to study Jewish history and engage in family <coughs> research that I discovered to my delight that my family actually belongs to another Jewish ethnicity known as Romaniot Jewry, an ancient Jewish group, which historically includes mainly Jews from the Greek world and the Balkans. These two cultures, Sephardic and Romaniot, contributed to a vibrant and creative Jewish life in Greece, which will be followed 
next week with a review of the Holocaust years, including a bit of my family story. And then in our third session together, we will discuss customs and rituals that are unique to Greek Jews. Greek Jews have always been very proud of their identity as both Jewish and Greek. The perfect blend, you might say, of the two most vibrant cultures of antiquity. When Greek Jews, even today, are asked to define their sense of identity, they often express one idea. Among Greeks, we are clearly Jews, but among Jews, we are clearly Greek. Talk about a split personality. As a Greek Jew in America, I can identify with this description of self. Among Greek Americans, I feel distinctly Jewish. But among American Jews, I continue to feel distinctly Greek. Both parts of my identity are strong and precious to me. And on top of this, I am also American. But most people never even associate the word Jewish with the country of Greece. No one spoke about this small but ancient Jewish community that was responsible for keeping Judaism alive in the early dispersions of the Jewish people. And until very recently, Greek Jewry was a forgotten population. Hopefully, this impression is now changing as more attention is being given today to the many different Jewish ethnicities that make up the entirety of the Jewish people. Let me share a moment that I remember from our first days as a new immigrant family in Baltimore in 1956, 64 years ago, when we first met with a social worker assigned to us from Jewish Family Services. Since language was an issue, our well-meaning social worker began to speak to us in Yiddish. Well, Yiddish was, of course, as foreign a language to us as any other. And my father explained that we were Greek Jews and did not speak German or Yiddish and did not understand it, even if it was spoken louder or slower. The social worker's reaction? What? You do not speak Yiddish? How can you be Jewish and not speak Yiddish? Well, talk about feeling out of place. I may have been only eight years old, but that reaction made such an impression on me. Of course we were Jewish. Of course we were Greek also. Why was that such a difficult concept to grasp? That was the moment we understood that our transition from the Mediterranean to America would take some work. Who are the Jews of Greece? Actually, the Jewish presence in Greece goes back to ancient times when Jewish people migrated there to escape war and to pursue commercial opportunities. Some believe that these migrations may have begun as early as the first dispersion of the Jewish people following the destruction of the first temple in 586 BCE, when the Jews of Judah were exiled to the Babylonian Empire. From there, some may have migrated to Egypt and to the Balkans or Greek Peninsula, where they stayed to build their lives as Jews in a new land. The first recorded mention of Judaism in Greece dates from the 300s BCE on the island of Rhodes. According to an ancient historian, Josephus, Aristotle wrote about meeting a Jew who was fluent in Greek. He said, the man was a Jew. Now this man who entertained a large circle of friends not only spoke Greek, but he had the soul of a Greek. He came to converse with me and other scholars to test our learning. But as one who had been intimate with many learned men, it was rather he who imparted to us something of his own. What does this simple passage show us? Well, it appears that this Jew was Greek speaking and learned enough to have a discussion with Greek scholars like Aristotle to the point of being praised for what he taught others. He even had a Greek soul. So as early as the fourth century BCE, Jews were living among Greeks and felt comfortable 
being part of the upper educated class. The first Greek Jew known by name is thought to be Moschos, son of Moschian the Jew, a slave who is mentioned on an inscription from around 300 to 200 BCE, recording his freedom. This inscription says, Frinidas will release Moschos to be free, dependent on no man. But if anything happens to Frinidas before the time elapses, let Moschos go free wherever he wishes, to good fortune. And witnesses, set up by Moschos, son of Moschian the Jew, at the command of Amphiaraus and the goddess Health having seen a dream in which Amphiaraus and Health commanded him to write it on stone and set it up by the altar. These two artifacts are evidence of both upper-class Jews and Jewish slaves in Greece at this time. A little later in the second century BCE, Josephus records the Athenian, that the Athenian people passed a resolution to honor a man, John Hyrcanus, probably the Hasmonean king and high priest of Judah, by raising a statue of him in the public square in Athens. Once again, we see Jews in the Greek world who are recognized and praised. We know that when the Babylonian exiles returned to Judah to rebuild the second temple, some probably stayed on in the lands they had become become accustomed to living. They may have kept their Jewish identities, but perhaps not. During this second temple period, the most legendary and well-known meeting between Greek and Jew took place with the arrival of Alexander the Great in 333 BCE after defeating the Persian Empire. According to Jewish legend, legend, and as reported by the Jewish historian of this time, Josephus, the first encounter was a meeting between the high priest in Jerusalem and Alexander, who was on his way to conquer and destroy the holy city. His first stop was Mount Scopus, from where he looked down onto the Temple Mount and saw a great procession of priests and Levites, led by the high priest in his royal robes, and wearing the headpiece on which was in inscribed the four Hebrew letters of God's name. At this sight, Alexander threw himself prostrate to the ground as if bowing to the gods. When his generals asked why he was showing such reverence, Alexander related a prophetic dream he had had before he ever came to Judah. In the dream, this same high priest appeared to Alexander and advised him to be strong and take courage, for he was destined to conquer Asia. The figure of his dream, this high priest, must be the God of the Jews, Alexander surmised. Thus, Alexander entered Jerusalem in awe and in peace, and Jerusalem was saved. Alexander became part of Jewish legend, and Judah and the Jews became part of the Greek empire. Thus began the confluence of two great civilizations, Jewish and Greek. Many historians have suggested that Alexander believed in the ideal of universal humanity. The oath he gave in 324 BCE at a banquet before 9,000 Greek and Asian officers gives us some insight into this leader of the ancient world. I will just read a couple of uh, passages from this amazing oath. In Alexander's words, it is my wish now that the wars are coming to an end that you should all be happy in peace. From now on, let all mortals live as one people in fellowship for the good of all. See the whole world as your homeland with laws common to all where the best will govern regardless of their race. Unlike the narrow-minded, I make no distinction between Greeks and barbarians. I, on my part, see you all as equal, whether you are white or dark-skinned. 
And I should like you not simply to be subjects of my commonwealth, but members of it, partners of it. This is an incredible document, even for us today. We see that Alexander's purpose was not merely to conquer nations or to acquire riches for his own self-worth and promotion, but to unite all people with the bonds of peace and mutual respect. For sure, Alexander believed that his rule was the right one and that he, along with his empire, was above all others. Still, we can't help but be amazed at his enlightened approach to leadership at that time. Alexander's empire attracted the Jews because of its welcoming policy, commerce centers, and international trade routes. Jews were accepted and integrated into the Hellenistic world. They admired Alexander the Great's style of governing that allowed for religious and civil liberties for his subjects. Archaeologists have discovered ancient synagogues and other artifacts along with literary sources, such as the writings of the historian Josephus, the philosopher Philo, and St. Paul of the New Testament that confirmed the presence of thriving Jewish communities throughout the cities of ancient Greece as early as the third century BCE. The remains of the oldest synagogue in European soil has been discovered on the Greek island of Delos and dates to the first century BCE, as well as evidence of synagogues in ancient Athens and in the city of Chalkis, the oldest continuing Jewish community in Europe. In the year 270 BCE, the Jewish, 70 Jewish Torah scholars translated Jewish scripture into Greek, which we call the Septuagint, opening up the study of the Hebrew Bible to the Greek world. The Septuagint was held in great respect by Jews in ancient times and continues to be studied today. Jewish lore and tradition also ascribe divine, divine inspiration to the translation. Alexander brought great changes to the Jews of the Near East. Greek and Jew would now share the same world, and from this would come great create creativity and strength, but also conflicts and contradictions. The rabbis have a saying, with it, each new language a man learns, he also acquires a new soul. How could Hellenic culture that centered around a multitude of gods, the worship of physical beauty, the rise of urban city-states, and a new Greek identity be reconciled with a Jewish culture that centered around one unseen god, Torah, spiritual life, an agricultural economy, and a sense of independence. This would not be an easy task. With the death of Alexander, the Hellenization of all Judah so as to unify the empire became the goal of his successors. Although many Jews welcomed Hellenization as an enlightened culture, Jewish traditionalists saw it as a threat to Jewish identity. Greek efforts at Hellenization of the total empire became increasingly more oppressive until a full-fledged rebellion was waged against the Greek army by the Hasmonean family better known as the Maccabees. Battles continue to rage on and off against Hellenism for Jewish independence. For sure, not all Jews were supporters of the Maccabees. Many believed that the Hellenic world was the future and wanted to be a part of it. But as we know from the Hanukkah story, the Maccabees were victorious, and in 165 BCE, the temple was rededicated to Jewish worship. And for the next 100 years or so, an independent Jewish state was restored. But the Greek and Jewish cultures had already become linked and the two nations connected in many positive and exciting ways, even as they remained distinct peoples. With the rise of Rome, Alexander's empire, including Judah, now Judea, came under Roman domination and another Jewish dispersion occurred with the destruction of the second temple by the Romans in the year 70, marking the end of the Jewish commonwealth. 
Jews were taken to Rome as slaves, along with the treasures of the temple. Eventually, new Jewish communities were established throughout the Greco-Roman Empire, including Greece. And so began the larger diaspora in the lands of the Mediterranean. So for more than 2,000 years, there has been a continuous Jewish population in Greece. Greek Jews have survived over 2,000 years of political and cultural changes, from Alexander the Great's Greek Empire, to the Roman Empire, to the Ottoman Empire, to the Byzantine Church, and to the modern country of Greece. These Jews of antiquity have come to be known as Romaniote Jews and trace their history to the exiled Jews who first settled in the lands of the ancient Greek, Greek world. The term Romaniot refers to the Greco-Roman Empire, which ruled this area for hundreds of years until the Middle Ages. The Romanio Jews and their descendants have been a consistent presence in the Balkan Peninsula, and specifically Greece since ancient times, despite the different empires that ruled the area. The Jewish diaspora spread to the cities of the Mediterranean. It is thought that the Romanio Jews may well be one of the oldest groups of diaspora Jews. The ancient Greek historian of the first century BCE, Strabo, wrote a 17 volume work, Geographica, about people and places known in the Greek and Roman worlds at the time. According to Strabo, there was no city in the known world that did not have its Jews. It is estimated that 2,000 years ago, one-tenth of the Greco-Roman world were Jews, meaning one million out of an estimated total population of 10 million. They lived in cities founded by Alexander the Great or built by his successors. Although Latin eventually became the language of government and law during the Roman period, Greek continued to be the spoken language of the people, and Greek culture continued to be the dominant throughout the Balkan Peninsula. The Greek world had profound influence on the Jewish world. A new Greek culture had been introduced to the Jews of Judea and beyond. Everyone could now be transformed into a Greek through the Greek language, Greek philosophy, and Greek ideas. In many ways, Jews became part of this Greek-speaking, Greek-thinking world, adapting comfortably, moving in and out of Greek circles in business and commerce, while holding on to and developing their own Jewish culture, communal life, and institutions. They spoke Greek, studied Greek philosophy, and adopted many Greek ideals, even as they remained Jews. During the period of the Roman Empire, the Romaniote Greek Jews felt comfortable and secure. They were protected by law and suffered little persecution. They were integrated into the cultural pattern of Greek life. We know from the New Testament of organized Jewish communities throughout the Roman Empire, which Paul visited in his mission to teach about Jesus. Paul, a Greek Jew in this Greco-Roman Empire, was born to a religious Jewish family and was originally named Saul, but changed his name to the more Hellenized Paul. A follower of Jesus, Paul spread his understanding of the teachings of Jesus to the Jews of the diaspora. He tried to attract other Jews to their ranks, preaching in synagogues on Shabbat. After the adoption of Christianity by Roman Emperor Constantine in 312, Jews began to experience periods of persecution and forced conversion by the very Christians who once themselves were Jews. Not accepting Jesus as the Messiah was to mark the Jews as sinful and deserving of punishment for the duration of history until modern times. Interestingly, today there are Greek Christians who believe themselves to be descendants of these forced converts and are trying to reclaim their Jewish ancestry, much like the conversos of the Inquisition a thousand years later. In 395, the Roman Empire split into two, a Western Empire centered in Rome under the Catholic Church and the Eastern Byzantine Empire centered in Constantinople, of which Greece was a part. During the following centuries, the Romaniote gained 
prominence for their scholarly works, liturgical poems, and mystical writings. Romaniote writings are peppered with Greek words and phrases, evidence of the author's familiarity with the Greek language. Greek and Judeo-Greek, or Yevanik, was the common language of everyday affairs, so much so that parts of Jewish liturgy were read in Greek, with Greek words written in the Hebrew alphabet. Their unique Judeo-Greek language allowed the Romanio to be at ease in speaking and interacting with their Greek neighbors. Because of the historically Roman Italian presence in Greece, many Romanio Jews also spoke Italian, as did my parents, especially on the island of Corfu, a former Italian province. They also developed a unique ritual in synagogue worship known as Minhag Romania, or Greek ritual, including a unique synagogue construction, Torah reading trope, prayer melodies, and other traditions that are different from both the Sephardic, Spanish-speaking Jews, and the German-speaking Ashkenazi Jews. Romanio communities were located in the Greek cities of Janina, Chalkis, Arta, Volos, pa and Patras, and on the islands of Corfu, Lesbos, Zakynthos, and Rhodes, among others. These Jewish communities claim an unbroken continuity with antiquity. In the 12th century, Benjamin of Tudela traveled throughout the Byzantine Empire and recorded details about the Romanio communities he encountered, including my city of Patras. He noted that they were engaged in trades of cloth dyeing and weaving and in the production of silver and silk garments. The Romaniot were the most influential Jewish community in the Byzantine Empire for hundreds of years, and their chief rabbis were held in high esteem. With the rise of Islam in the seventh and eighth centuries, much of the Roman world was conquered by the Muslims. And by the late 15th century, Muslim Ottoman control had spread throughout the former Roman Byzantine world including parts of Greece and even into Spain. By 1461, all of Greece was in Turkish hands. During the reconquest of Spain by the Catholic Church, the Church instituted the Inquisition to purify the Church and remove the unfaithful. Those Spanish Jews who were not killed or forced to convert began to arrive in Ottoman Greece to escape persecution and conversion by the church. At this time in history, life for the Jews was better under the Muslim rule than under the Catholic Church, especially during the period of the Crusades. The Ottoman Empire welcomed this influx of, influx of Sephardic Jews with an invitation personally ex extended by the Sultan Bayezid II. The most significant Sephardic Jewish city was Salonika, or Thessaloniki in Greek, populated largely by these Jewish exiles fleeing the Catholic Inquisition. In 1492, over 20,000 Sephardic Jews arrived in the city of Salonika, and another 36,000 Sicilian Jews settled throughout the Balkan Peninsula. The rabbis of Salonika took a bold step and issued a unique declaration recognizing as Jews those exiles who had been converted to the church. Greece became a haven of religious tolerance for Jews fleeing the persecutions in Europe. Within one generation, Judeo-Spanish culture spread in the Ottoman Empire, including Greece, and soon became the dominant one, overshadowing the Romaniote. Gradually, there developed two main traditions among Greek Jews, the older Romanio tradition of the Greek-speaking Jews of the Greco-Roman Empire, and the later Sephardic tradition of the Spanish or Ladino-speaking Jews of the Spanish lands and the Ottoman Empire. The Romanio culture is the more ancient one, known as Old Greece, while the Sephardic culture, known as New Greece, came much later with the Jews from Spanish lands. Highlighting these two cultures was an edition of the Hebrew Bible published in 1547 in Constantinople with the Hebrew in the middle 
the Judeo-Spanish Ladino translation on one side and the Judeo-Greek translation on the other side. At first, the more established Romanio Jews in Greece welcomed the new Sephardic arrivals, assisting them with their resettlement and offering financial help. The two communities, however, did not always get along. The newcomers, the Sephardim, considered themselves to be culturally superior, while the Romaniot felt themselves displaced by so many Spanish-speaking Jews. Quickly, the Sephardim began to outnumber the Romaniot. A new creative and flourishing period began for Balkan jewelry. Many Jews prospered and rose to high positions in the Ottoman Empire, of which Greece was now a part. As Sephardic Jews became the dominant element, they transformed Salonika into a flourishing commercial and industrial center. They excelled in many areas, especially in the fields of shipping, printing, fishing, mining, and textiles, as well as rabbinic scholarship, medicine, philosophy, literary arts, and law. The city became a center of Torah learning. Salonika's yeshivot attracted students from all parts of the Ottoman Empire, and even from Italy and Eastern Europe. Jewish Salonika could boast that there was no illiteracy among any of their population. The city offered a climate of tolerance and economic opportunity to these new Sephardic immigrants who thrived in their new home. The world's three major religions lived and worked side by side as Salonika's Jewish population continued to grow. Ladino, a mixture of Spanish, Hebrew, and Turkish, became the dominant language of these Sephardim and its use contributed to a unique and insular Sephardic Greek Jewish culture. Judaism and Jewish life thrived. Salonika quickly became the center of Sephardic Jewish life for religious learning, Kabbalah, mysticism, rabbinical training, and the printing of Jewish scholarly works. The fame of Salonika spread throughout Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa, giving the city the honorary title of the mother of Israel. By the 16th to 17th century, Salonika's Jewish population was the majority. Of course, one of the most brilliant and colorful, even bizarre Jewish personalities in Salonika was Shabbatai Tzvi, often referred to as the false Messiah. Having completed his rabbinic studies at the young age of 20 in the city of Smyrna, now Izmir, he gained a wide following as a scholar and Kabbalist. After his public self-proclamation as the Messiah, he was expelled from Smyrna and wandered throughout Jewish communities of Greece, Albania, and Turkey, attracting more followers. In 1651, Shabbatai Tzvi came to Salonika, where his behavior became scandalous once again, as he stood in the courtyard of the synagogue and publicly pronounced God's name and introduced himself as the Messiah. Even though the rabbinic council acted quickly and expelled him from the city, Shabbatai Tzvi continued to proclaim his messianic doctrine throughout the Sephardic world. His claim caused so much turmoil for the Ottoman government that he was imprisoned by the Sultan, eventually converting to Islam. Although many of his followers were rightfully disillusioned, others continued to believe in him and his teachings, even to the extent of also converting to Islam, as did some 300 Salonika families, whose descendants are still known as the Donme. This is just one example of the variety of ideas and beliefs that circulated in the unique atmosphere of Jewish Salonika. The 19th century in Europe was a time of a creation of new national states and regional nationalism, with each European nationality demanding freedom from the controlling powers. The Jews of the Balkans suddenly found themselves surrounded by new nations and their loyalties were called into question. In 1821, the Greek War of Independence against the Ottomans erupted. Because the Jews historically had a positive and close relationship with the Ottoman administration, they were often seen as disloyal to Greece. 
in a flare up of anti-Jewish sentiment fed by false blood libel accusations, 5,000 Jews were massacred in attacks and riots, while many others were driv driven away from their communities, which were decimated, including my city of Patras. Many cities lost their ancient Jewish presence until it was safe for Jews to return and rebuild. In 1832, modern Greece gained its full independence as the Ottoman Empire began to weaken. And by 1912, Greece had seized Salonika with a population of close to 90,000 Jews, most of them Sephardic. The city was so heavily dependent on the Jews that on Friday afternoons, all commercial life came to a standstill until after Shabbat. A humorous description of life at that time states that Salonika was a place where people worked only four days a week while resting on three consecutive days, Friday for Muslims, Saturday for Jews, and Sunday for Christians. Salonika was now the center of world Sephardic Jewry and Ladino was the language of business. The community enjoyed an active intellectual, religious, and social life with over 30 synagogues, 10 clubs, a college, four high schools, and 16 grade schools. They created a health and welfare system unlike any other thus far in the diaspora, including hospitals and asylums, orphanages, homes for the elderly, and Zionist organizations. Interestingly, many of Salonika's Sephardic Jews never became comfortable with speaking Greek, and in fact, could function very well without it. Even non-Jews learned to speak Ladino to benefit their businesses. By 1913, modern Greece took its final shape and, and former Jewish communities that had fled returned to the cities. Jewishly, the country now included the Judeo-Spanish Jews of former Ottoman empires, mostly in Salonika, and the Eastern and Northern provinces closer to Turkey, and the more ancient Greek-speaking Romanio Jews in the Western and Southern regions. At this time, life for the Jews began to change. As Greece turned the focus on creating a nation state with, with its own national character and common Greek heritage centered around the Greek Orthodox Church, Jewish identity was being called into question as Greece tried to define itself as one Greek state. In general, for the Romanio Jews, this did not present a problem as they were already Greek-minded and connected to Greek culture from ancient times. They spoke Greek and were integrated in the general life of their communities. For the Sephardic Jews, however, integration was not so easy. They were insular, holding on to their own language of Ladino and often keeping themselves apart from their native Greek populations. In 1917, Salonika suffered a devastating fire which destroyed some of the most of the community's infrastructure. The city was almost totally destroyed along with 16 of its 32 synagogues. 73,500 people were left homeless. As a result, many of Salonika's Jews emigrated during this period between the two wars and the population decreased to 50,000. Many settled in the land of Israel, especially during the 1930s when Salonika's Jewish dock workers were recruited to operate the newly constructed ports of Haifa and Tel Aviv. The decline of Jewish Salonika was compounded by the arrival of thousands of Greek refugees from the Greco-Turkish War and the population exchanges between Greece and Turkey that brought more Greek Christians into the city. The new Christian majority accused the Jews of holding on to their Ottoman connections and of not wanting to blend in with the Greek nation. The combination of anti-Jewish riots, Greek nationalism, competition for housing and jobs, and the undercurrent of anti-Semitism drove many Jews away in search of other homes in Western Europe, South America, and Palestine. By the eve of World War II, Salonika's Jewish population had decreased from 93,000 to 53,000. But the new Greek nation continued the work of nation building with its varied populations. For the most part, in the years before World War II, 
Jewish life in Greece was essentially stable and good. The Jews lived peacefully with their Christian neighbors, fighting for their country in World War I in the, and in the Greek-Italian War. Jews were respected members of society, involved in many businesses. They were educated, upper-middle-class citizens of Greece who were very proud to be Greek. They enjoyed relatively good relations with their neighbors in their hometowns. Outwardly, it seemed as if the church's teachings against the Jews did not match the reality, as Jews and non-Jews lived side by side, helping one another, celebrating social and community events, and feeling secure. Occasionally, Jews would be accused of a blood libel. Garbage would be thrown at Jewish homes during Easter and anti-Jewish sentiment would erupt, but life always returned to normal, except for the one time when all sense of normalcy would disappear and reality would become a nightmare for the Jews of Europe. But we will reserve this difficult and tragic part of, Greek, of the Greek Jewish story for our next session together. We have traveled a long way from antiquity to the 20th century. Greek Jews played an important role in Greek history, surviving changes and challenges. We followed their development from this ancient and proud Jewish community that was born when the Jewish people were supposed to have disappeared, as had their temple and nation. But they did not, we did not disappear. Rather, they reinvented themselves in new lands and built new communities. They faced new challenges and grew in many new ways but the most challenging time in all of Jewish history is yet to come. And our story will continue next week with the near total destruction of the community when Greece fell to Nazi Germany. Thank you for your interest. And I look forward to continuing next week and uh, talking with you. Thank you. I um, am happy to um, ask, uh, answer questions or have comments, anyone who wants to make a comment or add anything. It was great. I didn't believe you would do it in less than an hour. <laughs> so kudos. Amazing. Right. All those centuries, huh? So yeah. <laughs> and all that history. I'd like to encourage anyone, if you have any questions, now's the time to ask them. In Greece, did non-Jews have much of a sense of a difference between Romaniotes and Sephardim? According to uh, what we know, is that Romaniote Jews integrated um, much more and better than the Sephardic Jews. Because Romaniote, classically, they spoke Greek from the very beginning. Um, they did have a Judeo-Greek language, but mostly it was not spoken. Mostly it was written. Uh, so um, from the beginning, they were um, more Greek-minded. They were the ones that were, uh, you know, with Alexander the Great, they were the ones that um, were more connected uh, from ancient times. So they had way more years to be connected to Greece than did the Sephardim when, who came uh, many years later. Okay. Thank you. I mean, um, Spiros. Good evening. Has a question. Hi, Spiros. Hi, how are you? Great presentation. I'm so impressed and I love it. Uh, so musically speaking, do we have a record of the Romagnotico uh, repertoire? Uh, I know that the Sephardic, the Sephardio repertoire and music is something very active in Northern uh, Greece. Um, I would really be interested, uh, I am interested to know if there are any records that we can, uh, you know, look for, like the Library of Congress or somewhere in Greece that uh, it's possible. Oh, there's an old folkways record. I forget the name of the ethnic, uh, Amnon Chiloa that includes um, Romaniote songs. Mm -hmm. Also in the um, library at Hebrew University at the archives, several Romaniote Jews have been, um, have been recorded, but nothing has been um, pressed from it. We have Congress also has some. 
uh, there's a recording of Romagnot prayers out of the uh, synagogue in Yanina. Yes. Okay, so as you mentioned, a lot of the Romagnotes, they were speaking Greek. So I wonder if uh, somehow there is a, a Greek language uh, repertoire and, uh, you know, and I'm sure that they had also their traditional dances, the traditional cuisine, etc. So I wonder if there is any repertoire from uh, Epiros area, uh, like Ioannina or Arta or, you know, Patra, that they exist with uh, Greek uh, language, but keeping the tradition of the, you know, Romagnotica. Do you have anything uh, in mind? Or... You mean for the Romagnotica? Yes, the... yes. Yeah. If there are any singers uh, that they were, uh, you know, Greek speakers, or if there were any uh, cultural centers back then, or any repertoire that there was, right. you know? So um, there are some recordings of, it's mostly liturgical, the prayer, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, rather than, uh, I, I don't know of any songs that are particularly Romaniot songs. Um, and I think that um, Ephraim has some recordings, right? Right. Of, of Romaniot. Um, okay, yeah, because I'm really interested on this repertoire. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Rachel. Hi, I don't know who I'm saying hi to. Hi, it's Esther Burston. Oh, oh, hi, hi, Esther. Hi, how are you? Thank you, by the way. Hi to Ricky also. So I wanted to know, what is the Jewish community in Greece like now? In the town that you were in, is there still an active Jewish community? Yes. So actually, I, I, that goes into next week, the week after, week after. But um, the Greek Jewish community in total now in Greece is about 5,000. Uh, in, in Patras, my city, there are nine. Um, and uh, it, was all, it was always a small city, but uh, there are none. In Athens, there's about um, 2,000. Salonika in about uh, 2,000, also in Salonika, and 1,000 scattered around, um, basically. And then there's also some cities that have, you know, a few here and there, uh, 50 okay. Jews. Um, Athens has a, a day school, Salonika has a day school, um, and uh, several synagogues in Athens as well. Wow. Thank you so much. Nice to see you. Good. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Right. I have held you and said hi. Elaine Safran has a question. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. The question that I had is I'm wondering, um, Rachel, if you know anything about the two junk dealers in 1923 that were put on trial supposedly for um, stealing um, wire that was used uh, to um, communicate in the army. And it was just a complete fraud. Uh, and rabbi, Uzi, uh, rabbi Uziel was the chief rabbi of Salonika at the time. And he tried to intervene to, to stop these two men from being uh, hung. And uh, they wasn't able to. And I wonder if you're familiar with that at all. I'm not familiar with that case, but it's not surprising because that was the period in between the two wars was the period of um, the most uh, as rare as anti-Semitic attacks were in Greece. And at, I mean, compared to Europe, it was quite rare. Um, it did happen. And it happened during this period when Greece was trying to uh, build themselves as a new, uh, as, 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 as one country, one Greece, mm -hmm. um, especially after taking the last of the Ottoman Empire um, uh, territories, and Salonika was one of the last that came to become part of Greece. And so um, there was a lot of also there were population exchanges between Turkey. Right. And, and I, I just have one more question in light. So no, if I just want to say the refugee, that, that issue came up and the loyalties of the Jews came up. Right. I, I, what um, you're, make, you, you, you're saying that the Jews in Salonika and in Greece were, were not that persecuted until maybe the 1930s. But uh, it seems to me that to go from 
they weren't they were not persecuted compared well, I didn't to say they were not. I, in general in general you didn't right. have mass expulsions as you did in Europe. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really yeah, appreciate you. your talk. Lois Messing has a question. My question is about politics. Were the ancient Jewish Greeks very involved in politics at the time? Um, I would say no. Most of them were craftsmen um, and uh, shipping, fishermen, um, tradesmen, textiles, even ancient times. Um, uh, that, yeah, I, I don't think that they were involved in politics. So, um, you know, Jews don't have a great history of being involved in politics because they were always outsiders. And so, but even though they settled in Greece in ancient times, it was still the diaspora. It wasn't their own country. Um, so Jews in politics today uh, is a rare phenomenon. I mean, there are, so which is good, but it took a long time for that to happen. And look at, and look at Israel, how involved everyone is in politics. It's easy to be involved in politics there. Right, right. right. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Rachel. Can you hear me? Bill Sachs. Hi, Bill. Wanted to know about the next generation. Are they keeping to the culture and the uh, traditions of what? whether in the U.S. Oh, or Israel or Greece? Hmm? Are you talking about in Greece? Uh, Greece, Israel, U.S.? Well, we're going to talk about that at the third um, session. In general, um, it is very hard for the younger generation in Greece to keep a lot of the traditions of the family because the, the social support is so weak. Um, Athens is, has a big social network, Salonika, but anywhere else in Greece, in Greece is very, very hard. And many of the younger uh, population is moving to Israel. Um, it has been doing that for a while. So, but let's, uh, you know, we'll talk more about that the third time around. Um, Efrain, before you say anything, I just want to thank everyone because this was like a huge history lesson. Um, so I, I thought, I'm sorry if it was too heavy, but to understand where Greece is today, we needed to go through all that. It was not too heavy. Good. Okay. Good. Thank you, Rachel, for a riveting and informative lecture. We also thank Minister Tammy ben Haim again for helping us to commence this three-part series with most fitting opening remarks. Many thanks to the Embassy of Israel to the U.S. and the Embassy of Greece to the USA for hosting this series with Shin DC. Please join us again next week, October 29th, for part two titled The Holocaust Years, How My Family Survived. Her Excellency Alexandra Papadopoulou, Ambassador of Greece to the U.S., will be joining us then to give the opening remarks. Thank you and good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Good night. You are wonderful. You are absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much. It was informative. Kalispera says. Kalispera, Kalinichta. Yeah. Okay. And thank you, Panina, for helping wherever you are. Yes, thank you so much, Panina. Yeah. Parakalo. Parakalo. Good.